Good morning, everyone. Uh, Greg Reedman here. I'm president of the Charles River Regional Chamber. Uh, really happy to have you with us today uh, and uh, to have the folks from the uh, Charles River Watershed Association with us uh, today uh, to learn about this. Um, I just want to, a couple quick things to get started. Uh, we will take some Q&A at the later part of the um, presentation. So if you have questions, uh, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Uh, we'd love to hear who you are. So please go into chat, select everyone and tell us who you are. Um, so we know uh, that you're here and we can uh, get a sense of who's in the audience. Um, the Charles River Chamber and the businesses along the river and the four communities that we serve, which is Watertown, Newton, Needham and Wellesley, you know, really value our connection to the river and to the Charles. That's kind of why we chose to rebrand ourselves last year as the Charles River Chamber. Uh, the river is the thing that unites our communities. It's where industry first began. Uh, it was a, the river was a source of power for those industries that first came out here into the suburbs. It was a way to transport goods. Uh, and, and it's you know changed over time, but still the river is a really important reason why people love to be here and even why businesses like to uh, build and in, in exist in the old mill buildings along the river or newer buildings along the river. Um, but we also recognize that the Charles is a barometer for where we are in this moment of climate crisis. Uh, and the business community recognizes that it needs to play an active role in the stewardship of the river, uh, just as we need to play an active role in the stewardship of our planet. Uh, and that's why we want to be here with this conversation today. And uh, um, many of you, I know some people are very familiar with this project, but most of you, no doubt, are familiar with the dam, mostly thinking it as a really beautiful site. It's a beautiful location. It's nice to go there, especially with that new footbridge that was built over the river uh, between uh, the Newton side and the Watertown side a few years ago. Really is nice. It sounds beautiful. Um, it's uh, really a great place to be and a nice respite that many of us have enjoyed, especially during the pandemic. Uh, but this fall, I attended a walking tour organized by the Charles River Watershed, um, which was an eye opener to me and I think will be to you about the issues with the dam and what it means um, for our infrastructure, what it means for our environment, what it means for the fish and the wildlife and the river. Uh, and so that's why I invited today um, the watershed folks to join us. We are joined by Julie Wood, who's the deputy director of the watershed, and Robert Kearns, who's a climate resilience specialist. We will put their bios into the chat so you know who they are, a little more about them. Uh, but I'm going to kick it right off and uh, we're going to start with Robert. Thank you both very much, Robert and Julie, for being with us today. And Robert, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg, and everybody at the Charles River Chamber for having us here today to speak. Um, I'm going to just start off talking about who we are at Charles River Watershed Association or CRWA. Some of you may be more familiar with us than others, but um, CRWA, we're one of the oldest watershed organizations in the country, founded in 1965 by a group of concerned residents who are really concerned about the health of the Charles River. And we've come a, lot of, a long way since the days of the song Dirty Water, um, and, the, and the river has come cleaned up a lot since then from advocacy from groups like Charles River Watershed Association. However, we have a long way to go with our challenges facing, um, that we're facing from climate change and legacy dams in the river and watershed. And to first start off, I wanted to just humbly acknowledge that the Charles River Watershed resides on occupied territory of the Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag tribes. And we recognize and acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of the land in which CRWA carries our work across. And I just wanna, you know, some people may be wondering, what is a watershed? So watershed is an area of where all the rainfall and precipitation falls goes to a singular river or source. So as you can see, here is a map of the watershed. We have uh, 34 communities in the watershed and your chamber is made up of communities of Newton, Needham, Watertown, and Wellesley, which I'm going to highlight here, which is in the middle and lower watershed. So there's a lot of towns upstream of you all that are impacting you all downstream, and you all can impact uh, communities downstream like Boston, Cambridge. So just to bring the context of this conversation, there are over 3,000 dams in Massachusetts um, as you can see on the map, all of these different colored points are different dams that are um, that the state knows about. 
and many of them are relics of history and serve no purpose. Um, and in the past 12 years, 60 dams have been removed in Massachusetts, thanks to the great work of the Division of Ecological Restoration, one of the state agencies who's a great partner of watershed organizations like Sierra de Bray. And, the, and through the removal of those dams, um, we've been able to open up in Massachusetts over 300 miles of free flowing river and created 13 jobs for every $1 million spent on these dam removal projects. And the different colors of the dams on this map, red is a high hazard dam for its high hazard potential. Um, yellow is significant hazard potential and uh, the green is a low hazard potential. And the white um, boxes are NA or non-jurisdictional dams, which are not regulated by the Office of Dam Safety. And this slide is just showing us um, the history of dam removal recently on the Charles River. The last dam removal that has been done in the Charles River has been the Bellingham, which is the old mill dam, which the town of Bellingham was helpful in that removal project. So there is a historic precedent of dams being removed in the, um, the river. Additionally, um, since the beginning of an industrialization and um, colonization in the watershed, over 10 dams have been removed or breached from a storm or just um, the, the mill has you know gone under and they didn't repair the dam. So over the past few hundred years, 10 dams have been removed um, and not been built back up. However, there are 18 dams remaining on the main stem of the river. And this is just some history of Watertown Dam. So this dam was originally had, at this location, there were a um, fish weir that was used by indigenous people. So this location is a, a really um, significant history. Additionally, um, in the 1600s, um, the first dam was built in 1634 and it was a stone dam constructed using um, to power the grist mills and paper mills in Watertown. And around that time in 1738, um, the towns upstream of Medfield, Natick, and Needham, Newton, Sherburne, and Weston all complained to the Massachusetts State Legislature um, that the Watertown Dam was obstructing fish passage of migratory fish like shad and alewife that they were using for, um, for a food source, but also for, um, for their, um, use them for fertilizer for their crops. Um, and additionally, in the 1900s, it was transitioned to factory use and um, passive dam as electricity. In the 60s, it was rebuilt by the MDC, which is now DCR, to a concrete um, dam. And in the 70s, the fish ladder that you all are familiar with was built. And when we look, when we're thinking about dams and infrastructure in the watershed, we really have to think about climate change and the impacts that we are seeing from rising greenhouse gas emissions. And in the Northeast, we are expecting to see more precipitation, more strong storms, and increases in urban heat island effect. And these effects are unequally distributed and people of color and environmental justice communities are being hit the hardest in the first um, by these impacts. Um, and, and as you can see, we, we are see, seeing these impacts in the watershed. And a lot of times people think about on the right is the uh, Boston Seaport and, and the storm surge and the sea level rise that we saw in 2018. However, um, we know that Hurricane Sandy, I mean, excuse me, Hurricane Irene slammed Vermont as well as recent flooding in Massachusetts in 2010. Um, we're seeing that inland flooding is a huge problem for Massachusetts and New England. And the remnants of Hurricane Ida um, shut down um, the MBTA in um, Boston, and there was a lot of other um, safety threats like back in 2010 flood when there was concerns about the Moody Street Dam. So now I'm gonna transition over to Julie to talk more about our flood model project. Excellent, thanks Robert. Um, and I'll echo Robert's thanks to um, Greg and the chamber for inviting us to speak today. Um, great to see so many river enthusiasts um, chiming in in the chat. 
always happy to have a chance to connect with you. Um, so um, as Robert laid the groundwork for, um, there are a lot of historic dams on the Charles and throughout the state. And um, what's happening now is we're really kind of taking a new look at those um, with a climate change lens. The dams that were built um, were once ex really useful. They powered our mills and our industry, um, and they served as sort of the basis for our economy for some years. Um, obviously, that fell out of fashion at some point, um, but the dams, many of them were simply just left in place. Um, it wasn't worth it maybe to go in and take them out. Um, however, as these dams remain, um, we know that they were designed for a different climate than the one we are experiencing and a different climate than the one we will experience. So a lot of dam owners, um, government, non-government entities are really sort of rethinking um, their dams and what potential threat they might pose, uh, what potential, what this might mean for maintenance or um, additional costs around these dams to make sure that um, they could actually withstand the potential um, for the storms that we are going to get. So this little um, diagram on the right here just shows how rain events have already changed and become more extreme. And the prediction is that this will continue for our area of the country um, with more rain coming in more short, intense storms. Um, so even though perhaps we will have less rainy days overall, uh, when the rains comes, it is really going to come. So we're <laughs> gonna get a lot more big storms. And of course, those are the types of storms you worry about um, with infrastructure like dams. So one project I wanted to highlight is that the Charles River Watershed Association working with what we call our Charles River Climate Compact, which is um, 22 out of our 35 municipalities, recently partnered to develop the Charles River Flood Model, uh, which is a computer model that shows us where and when we might expect flooding from future rainfall scenario, current day and future rainfall scenarios. This is a tool that also can help us understand what might help with this expected flooding. So we can test out different mitigation strategies using the model. Um, it's a good way to kind of test out these strategies before making a big investment to see if these will actually mitigate flooding as planned. Um, next slide, or if you can click Robert, I think it was just a zoom in. Um, so this is, all these results are available online if folks want to check it out. Um, and this, as you can see, it shows flooding um, by depth um, along the river. This, again, is just a screenshot here from Watertown or Newton. Next slide. Uh, Robert referenced um, the 2010 floods, with fo which some folks uh, may remember. Um, these were, these are still really our floods of record locally for the region. Um, we got, it was about 18 inches of rain in 17 days, or maybe I'm transposing the numbers, but something around there. Um, this is a picture of the Watertown Dam at that time. You can see the, the parkland is, is totally flooded, um, basically up to the road. Um, right now, the dam does not operate as a flood control structure. There is a, um, it was built to potentially operate that way. It's just never has been operated that way. So it is not, um, it is not being operated as a flood control structure at the moment. Um, there was a feasibility study conducted in partnership with the Mass Division of Ecological Restoration um, from about 2018 to just finished up this past summer. Um, and the feasibility study noted that the dam isn't providing flood control. Um, and it also investigated the potential flood control. Um, and it's very minimal. Um, the dam, as Robert noted, was built in the 60s, um, was not designed to control, um, control water for the types of storms that we're starting to see and going to see. Um, so it, even if it were used as a flood control structure, um, it would store a very small amount of water behind it. Next slide. 
Um, so damn failure, is that, um, you know, that's, that's a question obviously to always think about, um, you know, is, is there a risk of that? And of course there is always a risk of that. Um, with the Watertown Dam, it is um, in, you know, in fair condition, the Department of Conservation and Recreation um, owns the dam. And so they, you know, do inspections on it. They have done some maintenance, like moving, removing trees nearby to make sure the roots aren't, you know, getting into the dam and compromising its structural integrity. Um, so they maintain it to make sure that, um, you know, it stays in, it stays in good condition and um, inspect it. Um, so that's one thing they look at is the condition of the dam. Another thing they look at is well, how bad would it be if this dam did fail? Um, and so they rank that using this sort of hazard potential scale. Um, and the Watertown Dam, because of its location, obviously an extremely dense urban area upstream of, you know, Boston and Cambridge and, you know, extremely high value real estate, um, it is ranked as a significant hazard potential structure, meaning that if it were to fail, um, it potentially could have some significant consequences. Um, however, again, as I say, they have you know, been maintaining it, doing some upgrades on it. So it is presently um, listed in fair condition. Um, so it's, it's certainly not in, you know, based on their inspections, it's you know, not looking like it's imminent risk of failure. And then they also have a sort of an emergency um, or what they call an emergency action plan, basically to understand what to do um, if there, if there were a failure. Um, but this image here just shows, you know, some areas that potentially would be at risk of flooding if the dam um, were ever to fail. Next slide. So a little bit more on this feasibility study. Um, as I mentioned, it was started in 2018, just wrapped up this past summer. Um, kind of the, the quick summary bullet of it is that it was found to be feasible, uh, dam removal, excuse me, was found to be feasible based on what they looked at in this study. Um, they looked at the um, sediment quality behind the dam. Um, and then they also looked at flow, how would the river flow change with and without the dam and did some modeling on that stretch of the river. Um, so this is available on our website if anyone really wants to dive in. Um, but this is generally seen as the sort of initial first step of a dam removal. Um, are there, and it basically answers the question, are there any major, major, major technical barriers um, or historical barriers? So that's really what a feasibility study does. Um, and as I say, it's, it's the first step on the journey of dam removal. Uh, there's typically also a lot of community conversations that need to happen, um, decision-making as a community process and with the, you know, for the dam owner to kind of weigh the benefits and consequences of dam removal from their point of view. Um, but this is a great initial first step, and we were excited that it didn't find any major technical barriers to removal. Next slide. A little bit more on the findings. Um, the upstream water levels would be lower without the dam. That's probably not surprising. Um, at the location of the dam, it's about six feet. The reduction in the floodplain, um, the impacts, how far upstream would this impact be? It's only about half a mile. Um, this is what's called a run of river dam, basically meaning the water is just going over it um, as water does in a river. And so the impact upstream from the dam um, is not very long. It's not, it's not a very large area. Um, it's also not a very high dam, um, you know, especially <laughs> compared to, I'm sure folks have seen pictures of dams out west, you know, it's, it's, it's not, nothing like that. Um, no change in anticipation for flooding or flow downstream of the dam. Um, so they really found that all the changes would be upstream of the dam and then flow and flooding downstream would be um, basically unaffected by removal of the dam. 
Um, they're, uh, again, uh, probably unsurprising because of the nature of the area, um, both the past and present development of, you know, it's a highly development, highly developed area, history of industry on the river. Um, they did find some contaminated sediment that would probably require offsite disposal. Um, occasionally when it, with a dam removal, uh, you know, the sediment will be clean enough that you can just remove the dam and let the sediment go downstream. Um, that's obviously the easiest scenario. Um, for this scenario, it would require doing some dredging and then taking some of that sediment offsite um, because you wouldn't want it staying there. You wouldn't want it going downstream. Um, but again, it, it's not um, it's not typically a huge barrier, and it's it's something that other dam removals have dealt with. Um, next slide. I will hand it back over to you, Robert. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. So you may be wondering, are dams really bad for the environment? You know, they look they look pretty. Um, Watertown is really a beautiful site, but kind of hidden under the surface, they are a concern for the environment. Um, first off, they degrade the water quality. The dams slow the water behind the dam in the impoundment area or mill pond, which leads to lower dissolved oxygen levels, the death of aquatic life, and more stagnant water. And because of the slowing of the water, um, it heats up and gets more stagnant. There's more evaporation behind there, which can lead to problems like cyanobacteria blooms and also instances of invasive aquatic plants. Um, additionally, behind the dam, as Julie was alluding to, sediment gets trapped behind it and has not been able to pass freely downstream to help um, with um, you know, the areas downstream that are starved of um, those sediments as well as your beaches and things um, offshore that you know you really want that natural cycle of sediments to go through a river system. Definitely downstream, um, the fish passage is blocked. Um, they're not be able to access the spawning habitat upstream. So you may be wondering, you know, Watertown Dam, they do have a fish ladder. Could you be building a new fish ladder? Well, you could, but um, you still have all these other problems with the slowing of the water, the um, in the increasing temperature of the water, all of these um, problems still exist if you just fix a fish ladder or build a new fish ladder. Additionally, some of the fish species, and we'll talk more about this as we go on the continue in the presentation, will still be remain blocked, including rainbow smelt, which really can't get up a lot of these fish ladders. And um, specifically in Watertown Dam, um, studies have shown that the female shad have not been able to past that ladder that's currently there. Um, additionally, fish will congregate at the entrance of the ladder, which increases pred pre um, predation. So predators like birds, as well as poachers can easily catch the fish that are all stacked up against the beginning of the ladder. And um, like I said, fish ladders don't improve water quality. They don't allow sediment transport and they don't um, restore the uh, movement of aquatic species. And like I said, many fish will still be blocked with a ladder and nothing beats a free flowing stream. And this is a picture of um, down in Plymouth at Town Brook. And this is just a picture showing all of these river herring, which is why the stream is a little more darker. You can see kind of some of the um, fish there, but they're all getting stacked up at this ladder at the Jenny Grist Mill. So they're queuing up to go up this ladder, but by just sitting here, they're just sitting ducks. So they're really vulnerable to predation um, and poachers when they have to really wait to take their turn to, to go up the ladder. So by removing dams, you're able to um, increase this and have a bigger area for them to go and hide and, and get through. And going back to history, there is a lot of records in the city of Watertown's public library from the, um, the uh, fish wardens who documented the movement of fish and helped them in the past. So definitely a great resource, but we'll share this with you all in the presentation. Additionally, um, I found this piece of legislation and, and um, law from 1795 talking about um, the town of Natick. They did a home rule petition to the legislature asking to regulate 
the shad and alewife fishery in their town. So it was very surprising to me to find out that the uh, alewife were able to all get all the way up to um, Natick. And it's been really interesting learning about the history of how far the fish have been able to get up. Additionally, um, in our work on the Eagle Dam in Rentham, we've talked to the Rentham Historic Commission and they've found records of Atlantic salmon making it all the way up to Eagle Brook, way up in the upper watershed in Rentham. So the fish really had a lot better passage back in um, the 1600s. And also we have records and have talked to people in Waltham uh, uh, in some of the tributaries like Beaver and Chester Brooks where they've seen them below some of the other dams in there, but the fish uh, historically were able to go up to some of the tributaries like um, those brooks in Waltham and to go to Hardy Pond. And there's some folks who came to some of our site walks from friends of Hardy Pond and Waltham Land Trust who are really interested in getting those fish back up into those tributaries and lakes and ponds. And I just want to build off of our land acknowledgement in the earlier presentation, talk about what we at CRW have been learning about dam removal where it relates to indigenous peoples. And firstly, Native Americans from the Massachusetts Nation had fish weirs, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, at the site of Watertown Dam, which was the so-called head of tide, or just upstream of the tide, high tide mark. So people may not realize it because of the construction of the, the old Charles Dam where the Museum of Science is, as well as the new Charles Dam, which is sort of between the North Washington Street Bridge in Boston and the Zakem Bunker Hill Bridge in Boston. Um, that dam regulates the tides um, in the uh, level of the lower basin area in Boston, Cambridge. Um, and, but before they constructed those dams, um, that area would, would go up and down with the tides, there'd be mud flats and, and the tide would come all the way up to Watertown. So um, it's been interesting learning about that as well. Um, and another thing that we've learned through the process of the South Natick Dam is that the indigenous people of Natick petitioned the Massachusetts State Legislature um, in 1735 uh, to try to stop the construction of the Watertown Dam because of the impacts of the structure to uh, the native fish populations, which were a critical food resource for these people um, and a nutrient source. Um, and these dams are really a direct result and legacy of the colonization, which favors the agricultural colonial settlers over the indigenous people. So um, it's just a, been a really good learning experience. And I definitely recommend folks listen to that um, historic and indigenous perspective from the South Natick Dam Committee um, last meeting. So I'm gonna hand it back off to Julie to talk more about CRWA's history in the Watertown Dam. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, yes, I'm going to dig a little bit more on the fish side of things. Um, probably a pun there that I'm missing, but uh, <laughs> we have, as Robert summarized, um, a number of species of fish that are what's called anadromous. Um, we used to have salmon. We don't have salmon. Salmon is probably one that folks are familiar with. So this is a fish that lives its life out in the ocean, but then it comes back into the river to lay its eggs. Um, and then the, the juveniles will return back to the river to lay their lay, river where they were born to lay their eggs, um, circle of life. So um, we have a number of species, um, as I mentioned, that do that in the Charles, which is great. Um, after the, um, or ex excuse me, the, um, the one I'm gonna talk a little bit, or the most about today is the American shad. Um, but I just want to highlight here before we get to the shad, the alewife and blueback herring. Um, the, the chart there, yeah, that Robert has his cursor over is showing um, how these two species of heron based on 2014 um, counts that were done at the Watertown Dam, um, how these, how, when, and how many of these um, fish are returning to the Charles to spawn. Um, so probably I'm guessing some of you have actually watched these guys try to get over the Watertown Dam. It, it is kind of a, a great show um, to check out. They really work hard to get up there. Um, these are counts, as I say, from 2014. Um, so hundreds of thousands of herring are coming into the Charles every year. 
um, swimming in. They get through the New Charles Dam, through the locks, um, and then they need another barrier at the Watertown Dam. Um, so the OIF and blueback um, looking pretty good, good, good populations. Um, of course, it would always be great to have more or have easier passage for them. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of a different story with the American shad. Um, if you wanna go next slide, Robert. The American shad was a historically abundant fish on the Charles. Um, major food source for both indigenous populations and early settlers. Um, and so not too long ago, state and federal fisheries agencies actually partnered to recreate the shad, restock the shad to recreate a recreational fishery for shad on the Charles River. Um, so for 11 seasons, um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and MASS DMF stands for the Division of Marine Fisheries stocked American shad in the Charles River. So they put in total, we had about 25 million baby fish or what are called fry, shad fry, um, released into the river in Waltham at, at the Ward Ave boat launch. There's some photos of us doing it. Um, so once these fish were stocked, um, obviously we would expect them to return to lay their eggs. So a few years into the project, DMF, um, DMF and CRWA worked to actually try and look and see if they were coming back. Um, and unfortunately, what we found during that monitoring was that the shad, especially the females, had a very hard time getting back to this spot um, in Waltham near Wharton at the Ward Out boat launch um, because of the Watertown Dam. So essentially they found that none of the, none of the um, shad were able to pass the Watertown Dam. Um, next slide. And a few reasons for that. Um, there is a fish ladder at the Watertown Dam. And so certainly the alewife um, and the blueback are using that to help them get upstream. Um, it doesn't work great for the shad. The shad are considerably larger than the alewife and the blueback. Um, and so the female and the females with the shads are larger than the males. Um, so the size and the location of the Watertown fish ladder, um, basically what, you know, what, what our partners concluded is that the size and location really doesn't work for the shad. So um, they can't find it. They're getting stressed looking for it. Um, the water downstream is quite shallow. It gets warm. Um, and so some of them potentially are spawning downstream of the dam, um, but that's cutting off a lot of potential spawning habitat upstream of the dam. And of course, sort of where they're wired to go is back to that location in Waltham where they were stocked as fry. Next slide. And then just the last topic we wanted to cover briefly is cost. Obviously a big consideration in any decision. Um, and so this is just a quick slide to, to point out that there is a cost to keeping a dam. Obviously there is a cost to removing it. It <clears throat> can be a fairly substantial project, um, but keeping a dam is not cost-free. And as I started off talking about with climate change, those costs have the potential to um, be larger than they may have been in the past. So there, a dam owner is required to do regular safety inspections, regular maintenance, um, and then potentially if your dam is not going to withstand the impacts of storms that we know are coming, you could, you could be looking at some reconstruction or armoring or um, whatever the case may be. So there is a cost to keeping the dam. There is also a cost to removing the dam. Um, next slide. This is pulled from the feasibility report that was led by the Division of Ecological Restoration for the Watertown Dam. Um, with the best guess, based on our existing knowledge, the best guess of what it would cost to remove the Watertown Dam. Um, so the estimate is around $2 million. Um, so certainly a fair amount of money, but of course, once the dam is gone, 
your costs are gone. There's, there's no longer maintenance costs. Um, so always important to consider those two factors. And then I think I'll hand it back to Robert for some nice looking pictures of what it might look like. Awesome. Thank you, Julie. One other point on costs I want to acknowledge is that with um, the federal infrastructure bill and the ARPA funding, there's a lot of money going towards water infrastructure and things like dams and restoration. So there, if, if the DCR wants to remove the dam and decides that there will be ways to find funding and sources from grants because of the um, competitiveness, because of all the fish species in the river as well. So like Julie said, I'm gonna transition to show you some pictures of what it would look like with the dam removal. Um, so first off, this is a view from today. Um, obviously not today specifically because it's all green and, and it's all uh, we're in the winter now and the trees have dropped and the leaves have dropped on the trees. But this is a view from California Street looking at the fish ladder here. And you can see the dam at this location as well as the old Sasaki building and the overlook on this side, um, opposite side of the river. Um, we talked to and got um, updated a rendering from consultants at SOR. Um, and this would be showing what would it look like if the dam was removed. You can see the vegetation would come back on the side of the river. The um, level of the water has gone down a little bit. Um, you can see there'd be rocks to be able to place where the dam was in order to um, you know, ha have that substrate for the fish, but also be a visual appeal so people can see and hear the sound of water going over rocks um, to sort of mimic the, um, the sounds and in, in sights people see of the um, current spillway. Obviously, it's not the same, but I, I myself find beauty in a lot of these dam removal sites. And um, moving on, this was from the feasibility study report that Julie was talking about. This is a drone shot of the dam. Um, one thing to note is this is, was during the construction, a reconstruction of the footbridge, so it's not there. Um, and this is the view um, during that time. And this is a rendering that they did as part of the feasibility study. Obviously, the bridge doesn't look like this, but you can see there is still a change in elevation at this location. It would be riffles, and you would have the rocks in the stream, like I mentioned before. Um, and this would allow... Um, for the fish to get up through this area. So it's just another different view. And you may be wondering, are these renderings pretty accurate? So we, we did work with SLR, which was the engineering consultant, formerly MMI. Um, and they did a rendering. This is a dam removal in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Um, this was a before shot, before the removal. Um, and this is one of the renderings that they did for that dam removal project of what it would look like after the dam was removed, obviously this river is a lot smaller than the Charles River. It a lot um, flatter and wider area than that Watertown Dam where it's more um, of a change in grade. But this was one of the renderings that they did with all the engineering and back knowledge from the feasibility report, of what it would look like in Connecticut. And this is what it looked like after the dam was removed. So this is bef um, before the rendering, after. So it's just to show that when they do these renderings, they actually look at the topography underneath the impoundment where the dam um, is before they do the picture. So um, that just kind of shows you what it looks like. In conclusion, um, here's a final picture of the um, rendering at um, California Street. And we can now transition to some questions. I see there are some in the Q&A box. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Robert and Julie. Thanks so much. Really fascinating. Can you, can we start maybe tell us what's the process to remove a dam? I, we saw that long list of various things. I, so you can't just bring a crane in and knock the thing over. You need, there's multiple steps. How long does that even take and what are the steps? Um, sure. Good question. Um, so the, you know, the, the, I guess going on the most recent one in the main, on the main stem of the Charles, the old mill dam in Bellingham, um, the actual construction is not uh, not long. Um, so typically, the long the long periods 
do tend to be, um, you know, leading up to decision making, planning, design, and permitting. Um, those can take years and years. Th those processes can can take years and years. These are typically not projects that are planned and permitted quickly. Um, people, as Roberts referenced, um, you know, people do often have pretty close relationship or feelings about a dam and a dam spot, um, whether it's the view or the sound. So these do tend to be uh, decision-making processes that involve a lot of community input or, or they should be, I guess, is what I would say on that. Um, so getting to the decision point, planning and permitting, um, you know, literally can be a decade or more, it can be a very long process. Um, with the Old Mill Dam in Bellingham though, for the actual construction, um, it was just a few weeks. It was just a few weeks to like actually get the dam out of there, um, you know, do the bank stabilization, stabilization they needed to do. Um, that one they did in the winter, um, you know, you obviously ideally don't wanna be there when there's very high flow. Um, so that actual process was a few weeks, but then you do also want plants to grow back in um, because you know most likely when you take the dam out, you're gonna have dirt exposed now that was once underwater that is no longer underwater. Um, and so there'll be some restoration work required there. You don't want it to get all covered with invasives and you know weeds and stuff and look um, look bad or you know be a smelly mud pit. So that process can also be a bit extended, making sure that you're you know getting native plants in there, that they're growing in, that they're coming in, um, and that you know that can take a whole growing season really kind of for the area to reestablish. Um, so, so thank you. And I want to go back to the decision process in a second, but let's just follow through. So first you'd have to dredge out the old soil, right? And then you remove the structure. Is that really kind of the shorthand for what needs to happen? Yeah, I mean, potentially there'd be also some, um, you know, rock placement, bank stabilization. Um, but yeah, the actual construction is, it. like I said, it was pretty quick in the Bellingham one. And, and the rock placement, I mean, I, I know that's, that's one of the things I mentioned earlier that it just sounds great there. You know, the sound of the, the yeah. is a nice sound. There's a way to replicate that with some rocks and give us at least, it's not going to be the same sound, but it wouldn't be quiet. Yeah, good. yeah, no, they, uh, you can do, you can do a lot in the design process. You can do a lot in the design process. I mean, even, you know, even a much smaller um, elevation change. So, you know, a mini drop that water's flowing over. Um, you know, potentially could be created as Robert referenced. This is sort of the historic head of tide. When the, when the tide did come up the Charles, it would actually come all the way up here. Um, so there is sort of a natural elevation change here, uh, which, you know, which makes sense. That's, that's kind of why there's, there's been a dam, been a dam here or before that, like a fish weir. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you can certainly do, there's, there's potential to do a lot with design and aesthetic. Um, of the site. And, and then you mentioned the evasive plants. So someone literally goes in there and makes sure the right kinds of plants are growing and removes things that shouldn't be there. Is that the process or? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. You would definitely want to um, plant native plant plants, um, have have an o and plan for that area in the near term. Um, because again, obviously with the river being a fairly disturbed system, um, there is that risk for the invasives to just come in and take over. Okay, and then just if I could follow up on that again. Uh, so on both sides of the river, whose responsibility would that be? Is it the abutting buildings that are along there that would be responsible for maintaining or planting those? Or is it part of DCR? Yeah, ideally that would be sort of part of the removal process, um, you know, that you would have you know, your main contractor sort of doing the work and potentially hiring someone else to do the plantings, you know, that would include like a year or two of maintenance to, to keep up on it, to make sure it's looking good. You know, yeah, one thing also, it's often part of the, the wetlands permitting from the local conservation commission. So that would be sort of one of the conditions often for the projects. So the wetlands permitting would determine what it is that abutters can or can't do or what happens there? 
Is that what you're saying? So it could define like the, the maintenance plan for for the for the plantings and that sort of thing. Okay. Great. Well, that's really helpful. So so now let's go back to the decision process and, and just so it's clear. So DCR is the sole ultimate decider here. And I realize you need buy-in and everything else, but is that correct? Yes, they're the dam owner. Yep. And and what have they said about this project or where does it fit into their thinking as far as you know? Um, yeah, they, you know, they are, they were obviously willing to be a partner on the feasibility removal study. So they were um, open to looking at it. They still have questions um, that the additional questions that they would like investigated. Um, they have some other dams that are taking priority for their focus, for sure, over this one. Um, this is, this is not the top dam on their priority list. Um, so they are um, at the table, but they are not saying they're taking the dam out tomorrow <laughs> or anything like that. Great, so let me go to some of the uh, submitted questions that we have. Um, what does it cost? I mean, well, you mentioned what it would cost to remove the dam. What is the, do you have any idea what the cost is to maintain it as it is right now? Uh, no, I don't know what DCR is spending on ma on maintaining this dam on an annual basis. Um, they've been doing some work out there in recent years, like I said, the tree removal. Um, so they may have an estimate kind of for an annual estimate of, of what the maintenance and inspection costs are for this dam, but um, I do not know. Right, and so then and this is a similar question someone else asked, but we don't know what a kind of cost benefit analysis would be over removing it and the money you'd save there versus the removing in the dam, right? We just, that's not information that- Yeah, as far as cost to DCR, correct, don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, if the Watertown Dam is removed, are there plans to move upstream to the existing dams in Waltham? Yes. Or the discussion, the discussions about the wall. <laughs> I actually want to ask about all the dams along the way, but are there plans or discussions ongoing right now about the dams in Waltham? And what's no, um, no, no, no real active plans on that. But um, and the the um, the Moody Street Dam, um, which is the one Robert had pictures of in the beginning. Um, DCR does actively use that one to control water levels. Um, folks may be aware there's, you know, if you've ever been to that site, there's flashboards that go in and out. Um, but of course, you know, it is another dam. It is another barrier to fish passage. Um, it has a fish ladder, but as, Ro as Robert summarized, um, you know, those are not, those are not as good at um, passing fish as just having no dam there. So. Um, just speaking from CRWA's perspective, you know, we'd, we'd love to explore all of them, um, but to, to kind of answer just straightforward the question, there's no, no real discussions on, on so, removing. And I noticed in the picture of the fish dam in, in Watertown, there's a keep out sign right there on the, on the ladder. Is it possible that maybe the fish, the shad can read and that's why it's not working? <laughs> Maybe that's it. There you go. So, there we go. Yeah. so the, you mentioned that there's a flood control function at in Waltham, and then I the one I'm more familiar with is at Echo Bridge. That's that's a flood control yeah structure as well. Are yeah. there others between those two between the Echo Gorge and and Watertown? Other bridges and either flood control or otherwise. Um. Well, it's it's interesting. One thing. Um, and this happened with the Watertown Dam. Um, a lot of these dams, um, or I don't know about a lot, but some of these dams were constructed with the ability to be flood control, but they're just not being utilized. Um, so sometimes when you look at the dam, you know, when, when they go in and do these feasibility assessments, um, you know, they're basically finding that, you know, some of this infrastructure is there and just not utilized. Um, but as far as sort of active, um, you know, to the extent active, I guess the flash, the flashboards are fairly manual at Ward, um, Moody Street. Um, but, you know, they do put them in and take them out. Um, and then as you say, there's the sluice gate at Echo um, 
at Echo Bridge or, or at um, the Circular Dam. Um, so those are the most, and then the neutrals, you know, those are the most active ones. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard to rule out that there's the potential for the, that these structures are, you know, exist and forgotten at other ones. Mm -hmm. One other thing, Greg, I wanted to mention, kind of answering some of that question about the upstream dams is the Bleach Tree Dam, which is the next dam upstream of Watertown Dam. They act, CRW work with DMF and DCR to do a partial breach in both sides of that dam. And in the latest um, inspection report, um, the consultant noted that that dam could be a potential, another dam to be removed because of um, it's not serving any purpose. So that's another dam that could be removed. No active discussions at this point, kind of sort of start at the bottom of the river and work their way up. Yeah, I'm sorry, Robert, can you, where was that again? Uh, the Bleach Tree Dam is in is in Waltham, which is upstream of Watertown, but downstream of Moody Street. It's a very small one, uh, but it, it does, and they've, they've notched two sides of it. So there's a couple spots where it's been partially breached, but not fully. And the, and the last one I wanted to ask you about is in South Natick. Uh, we know that the municipality is having conversations there about removing that. Are there flood issues concerned with that dam? Is there What is the concern with that dam in South Natick? Um, meaning, why did they decide to look at removing? Yeah, why, why are they looking at it? Why, why, what's the yeah, um, South Natick, it was, again, sort of a maintenance issue. Basically, they looked at the dam. Um, so what, what probably we all think of as the South Natick Dam is actually, is like technically a sluice way where the water flows over. And then the actual dam is this, you know, earthen man-made berm or hill. Um, you know, if you're in the park looking at the dam or lo looking at the sluice way on the other side, the sort of mounded earth, that's the actual dam. The big issue with it is that it has trees growing all over it. Um, that that the dam was built at a time when um, there were a lot less <laughs> regulations. And um, today we don't allow trees on dams because um, like we were saying, they can cause structural issues when the roots, you know, if all the trees get blown over in a storm, psh, that's washing out your dam. Um, so when, this, when the town who owns that dam looked at it, basically they were gonna have to take down all those mature trees. Um, and so they, that was their initial plan. They presented it to the residents um, and the residents said, well, maybe we should explore more options. And maybe one of those options we should explore is removing the dam. Um, so, you know, to their credit, basically that's what that's what the town did. So they're they're um, they're looking at all their options now, including removing the dam. Okay, great. A reminder to anybody: if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. Um, there actually is one more question here about uh, the Plymouth pl plans to remove the Plymouth Dam. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, uh, I can I can answer that. I used to work for Mass Audubon Sidmarsh Wildlife Sanctuary in Plymouth, and um, that, so the, the town broke in Plymouth, they've removed a, a number of dams. I don't have it on top of my head, but there were a bunch of dams upstream at Danny Grist Mill that were removed um, over the years because of the historic significance of that river, as well as it, it has a huge um, alewife and blueback herring fishery. So they did remove a bunch of dams between um, Plymouth Harbor and Billington Sea. Um, the Jenny Grist Mill, I'm not totally sure if they're going to remove that one. That one's really historic, um, but they they may um, do some other things there. I'm not totally sure, but they've removed a bunch of dams upstream of that location where the picture was that I showed earlier in the presentation. Got it. Okay, so let's go back to Watertown for the last couple of minutes here. Um, someone asked a question about whitewater kayaking and whether maybe there was even been discussions about trying to build a competitive course there, but in general, what would it mean for boat recreation on the river if that dam wasn't there, that part of the river? Um, you know, potential to go further upstream and further downstream, it would no longer be a, um, a barrier to, mm -hmm. to navigation there. You know, you'd, you'd no longer have to portage, which is a huge pain. Um, folks familiar with that area know that a lot of times the, the year it is pretty shallow there, um, so that you know that 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 still has does have a potential to impact recreation. 
Um, I know what there's, I know, I know they're responding to that photo uh, with the white water. That's what it looks like to me too. Like all, all of a sudden we should have a white water industry on the Charles. <laughs> so, so let's the, just to wrap it up. First of all, thank you both so much for your time. This is so really interesting. What should folks do if they want to try to follow this or be heard one way or the other on this process? What's the best way for anybody who wants to be involved, get involved? Um, great question. Yeah. It, so um, as I said, you know, with DCR being the dam owner, kind of the ultimate decider here um, and them not, you know, necessarily being ready to do this. Um, we are really building a constituency working to build a constituency of folks um, who want to push the state to look at this a lot more closely. Um, so the best way to get involved would be to sign up for our um, email newsletter. Um, if you put in your zip code and you live, you know, around here, that's also really good because um, then we can send more targeted emails, um, you know, on this particular topic. Um, but that is definitely the best way um, for you to stay involved with us and our work on this. Yeah, and also kind of sneak peek, we're going to be releasing soon a story map telling the whole story of the Watertown Dam and the feasibility report. And at the end of that, we're going to have a way to sign up directly to be involved in Watertown Dam specifically for that email list and also have an opportunity to tell your story about Watertown Dam. What, what, are, what, are your, what is your story? Have you seen the fish? Would this help your situation? So um, and we'll be collecting stories to help bring to the DCR um, to get a different perspectives on removing the dam. So that's to come soon. Got it. Thank you. And we will share the slides today with everyone who registered as well as the video today. Julie and Robert, thank you so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you to the watershed for your work on this. Thank you. And thanks for everyone who attended. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Bye.